Welcome to week 10 of HI3284. And this week we're dealing with monumental history and heritage. And it's going to be really interesting. There are wars over statues and monuments. And we're going to look at who's fighting them and why monuments are contentious or why they matter at all. We're going to consider how history becomes monumental. And underlying this lecture is for me that question of can monuments be interesting? What are they supposed to be communicating to us? And do they actually do that effectively? So here's how we're going to do it. We're going to start by looking at the statue wars in general and looking at conflicts over particular monuments and seeing why people get upset about particular monuments or what types of monuments people get upset about tells us a lot about monuments and how expressing history through monuments is problematic. Then we're going to look at the relationship between history, heritage, and monuments. And it's not a straightforward relationship. I think there's a complex and interesting relationship between history and heritage, and we'll start to pull that apart. And then for me, the big question is, can monuments ever be interesting? I'm not going to work too hard on the distinction between monuments and public art, but it's something that you might like to consider and consider too how, if it were up to you, you would create public statements about history. Monuments are a way of communicating rather than researching history. So they're a statement about history rather than an exploration of it. They are important to us in our cityscapes, in our daily lives, because they show us that history matters. And they're a statement about what, as a group of people, as a community, we think is important about our history. And as such, they're quite contentious. You may have noticed in the news conflicts over particular statues. And this is a long running thing. In the wake of Black Lives Matter, there's been discussion about statues of people involved in fighting to protect slavery in the United States Civil War, and in Britain about people who are involved in the slave trade, made a lot of money from it, and thus have been recognised as founding figures of particular cities or institutions. This isn't something that's just been happening recently. Discussions about statues and what statues are appropriate has been going on for the last 30 years. And if you look at Mary Beard's work, she pushes it back even further and says it's been going on for millennia. She's a classicist. She studies ancient history. And so she's got an interest in finding reflections of the present in ancient history. She's also a very good historian and her work is worth reading. The latest flare-up of the Statue Wars, according to those who pay attention to these things, can be traced back to an attack on the Statue of Cecil Rhodes in Cape Town in 2013. And certainly, as I say, if you look in the recent newspapers, you'll find lots of flare-ups in terms of controversy about statues. In Townsville in 2020, you can see there was an attack on the statue of Robert Towns, which is down on the Pioneer Walk in town. And there's ongoing controversy around that statue, enough that if you look in the caption to the image, there was a report written by a very good historian, Kit Kennedy, in 2004 when the statue was proposed, talking about the controversy around Towns. And it's intriguing that even that recently, 2004, Townsville did choose to put up a Pioneer's Walk and to include a statue of Robert Towns. The Pioneer Walk tries to recognise the diversity of Townsville's history, but it's an interesting statement about what the Council sees as important aspects of our joint past. And in 2020 as well, there was considerable controversy around commemoration and memorialisation of Captain Cook both in Australia and in New Zealand. And mentioning the recent origin of the statue of Robert Towns in Townsville, it's not the oldest monument to Towns in Townsville, but it's intriguing that in 2004, the council chose to commit to another one. 
The timing of these monuments is interesting. In the United States, there's been controversy around statues commemorating Confederate heroes. But if you look at the dates, they're put up long after the war is over. So at least 30 years after the war and up to 100 years after the war. So it's a reaching back from the communities in those periods when the statues are being put up to that past and a statement about the past that is important to them. One of the things that you find in the history subjects that I teach is that I'm often perplexed. And I must admit that I find statues of people quite perplexing. I'm never quite sure what meaning I'm meant to attach to them. And this is one of those interesting things about monuments. These monuments mean something to the people who are willing to pay money to put them up. But what their interpretation should be is open to the viewer. They're meant to communicate ideas, sometimes quite complex ideas, but use very little words. Generally, there is some kind of statement of what the statue is actually of or who the statue is actually of, and perhaps some guide towards interpreting it, but not many words at all. And generally, these monuments carry large ideas for the people who put them up, but communicate them with very few words. David Lowenthal has published a very interesting book about the connection between history and heritage. And perhaps this is a distinction that you're not used to drawing. Lowenthal links interest in heritage to the current enthusiasm for family history, which is something else that we've touched on in the subject. And no doubt I'm going to get to nationalism in this lecture as well. He argues that many people in the present feel rootless, and so they are seeking the reassurance of belonging. They're looking to family history to provide them with a sense of where they come from and to heritage for the same reason. The whole point, he says, of heritage is not the past. The whole point of heritage is the present. Heritage, heritage sites, uh, heritage events, collections of materials are reassuring to us in the present about who we are and what our past is and what that means for who we are in the present. Sometimes the reassurance is that we are victims and we have suffered and so to some degree we are on the right side of history. But according to Lowenthal, heritage is not history. It doesn't have the same nuance as history. In history texts, particularly in scholarly history texts, there tend to be quite complex arguments. The past is seen as multifaceted and complex and needing to be picked apart, considered and put back together again by trained and thoughtful historians. Heritage appeals more to our emotions. It has compelling narratives and good history has compelling narratives as well, but heritage is all about that compelling narrative. And it tends to avoid questions about when great men weren't good. There are obvious examples, as I've mentioned, with those statues in Britain of slave traders who then donated to worthy civic causes. Similarly, in the United States, some of the founding fathers were slaveholders. How do you deal in statue form with the complexity of human beings? who can do good things and bad things and be the one person. And we can see that perhaps in the 2020 discussions around Captain Cook. His legacy is a complex one, and the complexity of his voyage is impossible, I would say, to distill into a monument. Lowenthal's book is also interesting in its analysis of the way that heritage does not need to accurately reflect the past in order to be effective heritage. It argues that many heritage sites are in various ways manufactured. On this slide is an image of Captain Cook's cottage in Melbourne. This is undoubtedly a cottage which was brought over brick by brick from the, well, they fitted numerous bricks on the one ship. 
it was disassembled in the UK. The relationship between the bricks was carefully noted. It was reassembled on arrival in Australia exactly as it had been in the United Kingdom. It's from Cook's period. It's from the region that Cook grew up in. The problem with calling this Captain Cook's cottage is that it's doubtful Cook ever lived here, although it is possible that he may at some point have visited it. Even the plants are authentic. They brought over cuttings from the plants where the house was originally built and grew them in Melbourne for that degree of authenticity. So it's certainly heritage, but I have a difficult time seeing this as history in any meaningful sense. It's also problematic that this cottage was brought across to Melbourne because, as you'll probably be aware, Captain Cook never visited Melbourne. And so why he is commemorated there is an interesting question. But I think it's answered by Lowenthal in that argument about what heritage is for. Heritage explains the present. How is there a city, a European-style city, in this part of the world? Here's Captain Cook's cottage. Why is it good to be Australian and living in this part of the world? Here's Captain Cook's cottage. Are we worried about whether this is meaningful in terms of history, or do we just want a connection to that proud history of Australia being established somehow in the wake of Cook? Well, here's a very authentic version of a place that Captain Cook never lived. And heritage certainly differs from history in the weight that it places on certain events in the past. Knowing my tendency to look to nationalism, it won't be surprising to you that at this point I'm going to bring up the example of memorials, Australian memorials to the First World War, and Australian memorials to the influenza pandemic. Worldwide, there are very few monuments to the influenza pandemic that followed the First World War, despite its huge death toll. In Australia, there wasn't such a significant death toll. Australia was lucky in that 1918-1920 flu pandemic. That's not true in New Zealand. New Zealand suffered badly in the pandemic. But in neither place is there any great commemoration, public commemoration, of that flu pandemic and the people who died in it. In New Zealand, there are seven publicly accessible monuments to the flu. In Australia, there are five, despite Australia having a larger population. As this is something I've been thinking about, I have put some references to this idea in case you want to follow them up. There's Peter Hobbins, Head of Knowledge, and a very short article in the conversation about why Australian victims of the flu are not commemorated in the chapter on COVID-19 or precedents for COVID-19 that I published with Patrick Hodgson, we also address that matter and the matter of disaster memory more generally. So what do we remember as a community? What do we somehow manage to forget? And monuments are an interesting example of this. What as a community do we hold on to in our collective past? What do we forget about? And are those things we forget about significant in the historical record, but somehow lost in terms of heritage? World War I is certainly not lost in terms of heritage. And there are many, many war memorials around Australia. I'm not going to try and count them all. But talking about remembering and forgetting, even monuments can't protect us from amnesia. Monuments can be easy to ignore. I say I'm perplexed by the majority of them. I think passing this in Newcastle, and I may have passed this in Newcastle, I would be perplexed. With my colleague Russell McGregor, I attended a conference paper on Newcastle's coal monument, this coal monument titled Coal Must Fall. It was a take on that Roads Must Fall protest against Rhodes statue. But my colleague pointed out to me at the end that the most common reaction by Newcastle locals, noted by the speaker, was surprise that the monument existed and realisation that they must have seen it and not remarked on it. 
So the conference paper was about how Newcastle needs to move away from coal and recognise the difficult nature of this part of its history. But the speaker mentioned very clearly that when she talked about this particular monument to coal and coal mining, which is present in Newcastle, most of the people she spoke to from Newcastle hadn't noticed it. And it's an interesting statement about the communication of history and of heritage. How many of us are simply perplexed by these monuments and either ignore them or struggle to understand the message that they're supposed to communicate? How much time do we actually spend engaging with monuments and statues and these statements of the past that we're supposed to respect? And are the current statue wars actually giving power back to some of these monuments that would otherwise be ignored? Having said that, one of the really interesting things that Mary Beard brought up in her long history of statue wars is how often communities have felt the need to take down statues and to try and rewrite history to exclude those who have fallen from power or from favour. Certainly it happened in the former Soviet Union and it happened in Iraq. Australia as well is in the process of lining up its heritage to accord with the history it wishes to recognise. In 2020, Western Australia renamed the King Leopold Ranges because it realised it no longer wished to be associated in any way with that Belgian king and the atrocities he was responsible for in the Congo. In the same year in Western Australia, though, there was a destruction of the heritage within the Duke and Gorge Caves, those caves which reflected 46,000 years of human habitation in Australia, were destroyed as part of an iron ore exploration project. In the same year, Western Australia rewrote its imperial history and disassociated itself from King Leopold and the Congo, but it was also the site of destruction of tens of thousands of years worth of heritage in this particular heritage site. And there are concerns about continuing destruction of Aboriginal heritage sites in the service of mining. Statues and monuments and heritage matter. They matter to people and they're a form of investment by various organisations at national, state and local level in Australia. In the tutorial, I'm looking forward to hearing about monuments that mean something to you or monuments that you're interested in the fate of, what you think they represent, what you make of them. While I've mentioned generally being perplexed by statues of people, I don't want you to think that I'm a complete Philistine. I do actually quite like public art. And one of the things I hope we'll discuss is what styles of monument are possible and what styles of monument are meaningful. On this slide, there are two monuments which are actually in close physical proximity. On the right is a monument that was put up in the interwar period, and it's a memorial to the First World War. On the left is a 2015 artwork which memorialises Indigenous soldiers. They're quite different approaches to this topic of how do we remember the soldiers that we have sent to war. And in this week's video, you will spend time with the Ingham Mosaic, which is again a public artwork talking about the history that is important to that particular region. In the tutorial, I'm hoping we're going to talk about monuments in general, as I say, those that are meaningful to you and those which perhaps perplex you as well as me. And we can talk too about fashions in monuments. We tend to recognise cenotaphs when we see them because they do follow a particular style. And I've been intrigued around Townsville as well with the rock with plaque style of monument 
to the First World War, which seemed to come into popularity in the 1990s. There are, though, a multitude of approaches to the past and to heritage which are possible. And it's something that, in this subject, I'd like you to be aware of. Not only have we spent the first two modules finding out about the past, now, in the final four weeks of the subject, we're in the process of making history. As historians, how do we communicate history? How do we communicate about the past? And how do we see ourselves in relation to the heritage industry?